Hi, everybody. Welcome to Conversations with Calvin, We the Species. Uh, it's um, actually the kind of the end of September, and, and I'm with J.L. Torres, and uh, we've been actually, uh, for the last hour, just chatting about the world, <laughs> about just about every, kind of, yeah, about every kind of topic from environment to Lenny Bruce, yeah. Puerto Rico, uh, uh, and and uh, I figured, well, let's press the button. Do <laughs> Sooner or later, right? To get this stuff, yeah. this yeah, stuff so on. Because we yeah. would just keep talking and talking. Uh, it, it, there's some great commonality. Uh, we met and we discovered so many different uh, uh, elements of commonality, which I love. Mm -hmm. uh, and the official title, J.L. Torres, writer, professor. Uh, he likes being called a teacher but he's a professor um, and he's a Puerto Rican gadfly, which he will uh, discuss. Okay. Uh, and his last uh, PhD degree came from USC, uh, PhD in English language and lit. And uh, that's my, and there's so much uh, to unpack. So um, a quick, maybe a quick bio. Um, sure. Uh, and and then we'll jump in to our questions. But thank you so much, Jail, for being here. Well, first of all, thank you. First of all, for just having met you, it, it's been a pleasure. Just the, the past conversations we've had, and we do we do have a lot in common, which is, including Puerto Rico, which is interesting, and 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 this opportunity to to be on your podcast. So I, I really appreciate it. So um, my my bio. Um, so I, I was born in Puerto Rico. That's a very important part of me in Calle, which is in sort of the central part of, of Puerto Rico. Uh, I came to the U.S., you know, or actually I was brought to the U.S. by my mother, who was trying to sort of still work out her relationship with my, my dad, who had moved, you know, to, to, to New York. And so that did not work out. So my mother then became a single mom. Uh, we sort of followed the migration pattern in New York City for Puerto Ricans. We started in Williamsburg, which at one time, you know, had a, a, a Puerto Rican population, and then to, to El Barrio. Back then, it was called Spanish Harlem. And then we moved to the South Bronx. At that time, when I moved to the South Bronx, there were only a few Puerto Rican families there. So we actually, uh, we were sort of at the beginning of that white, you know, flight to the <laughs> suburbs and other places as, as we started moving in there along with African-Americans. But the, the, you know, New York City was a very formative years it were absolutely important to me living in New York and, and growing up in New York and in the, in the Bronx, it's more specifically the South Bronx. And then I went off to school, I went to Vassar College, which is a Seven Sisters school, just when it was, became, that's a whole different story, Calvin, when it was just becoming co-ed, I, I was maybe the third class of wow. uh, co-ed. Wow. And, uh, and this, you know, if anybody knows anything about Vassar, Vassar has a history, a tremendous history, a feminist history of women, you know, very, very independently minded women, et cetera. And so uh, then I got my MA, my MFA from, from Columbia, when I sort of felt writing has always been a passion for me. And I wanted to continue writing and I felt maybe I should get a degree in it. So I did. And then I went to New York, to Puerto Rico for just basically one year. I, I just decided, let me just go to Puerto Rico and get some material to write. But I also was there to help my mother, who was already there, and she was living with my sister, and she wanted to um, move into a house that she had. She had been living in Puerto Rico for two, three years, and she hadn't been able to move to this house in Calle, where we were born, where I was born. And I said, Ma, I'll help you. I'll help you for that. I'll go there for a year, check out, you know, Puerto Rico, and, and, and maybe do a little writing. I subbed in my apartment. But then I got a job there teaching at the college there. <laughs> and that did. I was hooked. I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. So then I moved completely and lived with my mom for, for a while. And I, I got my, uh, I finally got my MFA, you know, because I had to write my, my collection, my story collection for my thesis. And then I went there and I realized that they don't consider a master's degree in fine arts as a terminal degree as we do here. So I said, I'm always going to, if I'm doing this, and this was a tenure track position eventually, I said, this is not going to help me out because the pay was just so bad <laughs> for MA. So I said, I want to get a doctorate. So then I went to USC and got the doctorate and, and I came back. And this is another thing I would not suggest to any of your viewers to ever get married at the same time you're starting a doctoral program, <laughs> which is what I did. And my wife and I, uh, you know, I mean, 
we 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 decided to get married that time the first month that I was going to go and then we actually our honeymoon was traveling across the U.S. Wow. through the southern route to get to Los Angeles and then uh, we had to go back to Puerto Rico I went back to Puerto Rico because I had this commitment they helped me with my studies and so I had to stay there and my wife was not a fan <laughs> my wife is Puerto Rican a Puerto Rican you know uh, uh, parents and she was born in Wisconsin lived in Chicago she never really lived in, in Puerto Rico and then lived in New York City like I, I we were both New Yorkers and she said honey I love you but I can't I can't stay <laughs> for all the time we, you got to do something move on so I, and I was also getting a little upset with the politics there and and, and just you know having the pay was so bad and I had to sometimes teach six classes and things were just not breaking down. This is before now this economic downturn. This was just the beginning, I think. So by 2000, we, we decided to leave. I got a job. I was fortunate to get a job at SUNY Plattsburgh, part of the SUNY system, up north. I didn't even know where it was, Calvin. <laughs> I had to look at a map. I said, where the hell? I mean, it goes to show you, right? Our New, York, New Yorkers from the city are just like what's the that's like out there you know that's famous steinberg map yeah the new yorker yes it that's how it felt i said where is this place I, I had no clue and i said holy this is like really far this is like up by the border in canada so uh but then we ended up here and we actually love it it's a it's a wonderful community it's beautiful up here i mean we're just waiting for the foliage the foliage is just just yeah. seeing the foliage in the autumn is great yeah. so now here we are I'm retired after 40 years of teaching and I've dedicated myself to, you know, my second passion beyond teaching, which is writing. And um, I've published four books up to now. This migration is the so new showing. Yeah. I just, I just got this from Amazon Yeah, and, and I it's, haven't cracked it open yet because it just came, but uh, I'm, I'm going to, and in, in this one, uh, the first, uh, is it Tomas? Um, like Tomas Rivera Prize, book prize. Yeah, it's it's the inaugural winner, which I'm very proud yes. of. Maybe we can talk about that a little later. But that really is uh, that's been my my bio. As you can see, it's very much. I mean, I'm more than just a I mean, I'm a I'm a husband. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a father of two wonderful young men uh, who are making their way in, in, into life uh, as I speak. And um, you know, I, I try to be as active as, as I can. I'm very concerned about a lot of issues, social issues. I am downright really a political writer, I think. I really consider myself a political writer who's very concerned about social issues and I use it. Now, this is not to say I'm didactic because as you will, as you read the stories and other people have read the stories, you know, there, there's a lot of craft in these stories. They're just, uh, I try to tell a good story. So that's what I'm trying to, to also do, but also make people think, you know, as they, as they read these stories, really not so get some kind of emotional, you know, connection to, to these characters and what's happening. So that pretty much is who I am, part of what, who I am anyway. Okay. You know, it's funny, you, you use uh, the word didactic. Mm -hmm. and, and I think in every Woody Allen movie, at some point or another in the dialogue, Woody Allen uses the word didactic. Mm. Um, I, I can actually remember him using it uh, in Annie Hall. Uh, I think yeah. they're waiting in line to watch a movie yes in fact i, I know that a lot and then he talks about marshall i forget his first name it, I, he's a he's a famous uh, the, the guy that yeah, talked about cool correct. medium hot medium and then he's talking whatever and that's not what he said and so well i have i have him right here yeah waiting in line and then he says no I, that's nothing to do with what i'm saying i, I love that scene yes because it just, it just you know he does that he breaks out of like you know, the, the, it, like it's a fourth wall. He breaks yes. and he brings in somebody else. I love it. Yes. Yeah. Was that Marshall McLuhan? Or, or? Raj, right, McLuhan. Did I see Marshall? Marshall McLuhan is his I name? Think it was, I, I think it, it was that. I think uh, it's Marshall McLuhan. Yeah. You're right. But the first, I knew Marshall was in there. Yeah. Name. Yeah. It's it, so it, funny. It, it, yeah. You it's know, it's uh, great. I, I get a kick out of that. Uh, yeah. I watch that movie all the time. Yeah. Because, yeah. Um, but that's, well, oh, I, some would say his best film right if you go by that was the only one but you know what he did was very difficult to to actually win academy award in with comedy. comedy it's not easy i think no I maybe that might be the only one i don't know i don't, know. I don't I'm, I'm, I'm not sure i don't yeah. know if there's been another one i'm right. trying uh 
There was a Clark Gable movie with Claudette. Oh, it happened there. one night. It yes, happened it one happened night. one night. And yeah, and that was uh, yeah, that is a comedy. That one, that's good. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there was because, a great uh, scene yeah. there when. With the curtains, yeah, the curtains. Yeah, yeah. We uh, obviously very. We were both very film fanatics. Yeah, <laughs> we are. We didn't, we didn't even know this. Uh, this is another commonality. Okay. <laughs> yeah, film. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. So, I yeah. So by didactic, I mean I can see that because I think anybody who's a creative person does not want to be didactic, in the sense that you, you you're sort of semi propaganda. You want to be able to let. The work speak for itself right and i hit people over the head with a sledgehammer and saying this is what uh but you know at the same time i i think i come from a sort of latin american um artistic perspective latin american writers directors they're not afraid of saying i'm political you know they they're not and the u.s and you tell me what you think about this but you know there, there's a sense that there's the politics and the politics have nothing to do with art you know this kind of thing and you should just be an artist so people get upset when it's when all these filmmakers or actors go up and say a speech and these are they're citizens just like everybody else they have the right to speak and if they have a platform and they're really very passionate about what they believe why not you know you, you you can't tell me that art is not political of course it is i believe and when you really look at everything everything is political to a certain degree and i certainly that that is my perspective on literature literature is highly political of course it is it always has been some more flagrantly so than others but if you look at a text and you analyze it and you critique it, you realize there is some form of ideological concern there or something. And so, of course, it's there. And I, so I, as a writer, producer of that, I'm going to just completely forget that? No. I start off with that. So therefore, I just tried to, to write work that is going to make people think. I don't, this is why I don't write. I don't write fantasies and I don't write, I, I mean, do we need fantasy in this world now when everything seems to be falling apart? I know people... We People need, like to gravitate, need, right? We all like to just float yes. away and not deal with stuff, but yes, yeah, we need to think. Mm -hmm. Um, let's uh, you know, we've, we've got a whole list of uh, commonalities, uh, mm -hmm. um, and we both kind of came out of the 60s. We're boomers, right? That's yeah, like, that's, that's um, right. we are boomers. Um, so, um, do you have memories from the 60s and and, and how that? period of time helped form you oh absolutely i mean again i i went to to vassar right well this is a little bit after the 60s because i mean again the 60s i think i'm a later bloomer you know i, sure. I was maybe in the 60s i was eight ten years old okay, you know? okay. i do okay. remember vividly uh john f k the assassination and in, in, in the funeral i mean that's still in my i mean scar along, along with you know 9 11 i still remember that so that was certainly something, and I remember the civil rights movement, very much watching it and, and those horrible scenes of people being attacked by dogs. And so that's still, you know, I remember that it's relatively young. And then I remember Bobby Kennedy assassination. I remember, you know, Martin Luther King. I grew up, that was my teenage years. So of course it's gonna form me. And then I also begin to start my journey as a person of color, understanding what it's like in a working class background, I begin to realize uh, things and things are open to me. So I go to Vassar, a school that was very feminist. Like the women were really, and in a period during, everybody seemed to be radicalized in one way or the other. So I was involved in marches. You know, I, I was at one time, you know, uh, a member of the Social, Socialist Workers Party, you know, I, I, and I wrote for, for, them, for them. So I, yeah, I was, I was very political. And I don't know how I, at that time, and frankly, we have more problems now <laughs> than we have then. And we were very much committed to change. And, and environmental, you know, Earth Day, right, started with, with, with our generation who felt we had to do something. And, and, you know, we've committed mistakes and problems like every generation. But I think if you're of that, of that age group, I think you can see how we gravitated to a political sense of the world. I mean, I also grew up when, when Chile was overthrown, I mean, Allende government, and then to find out that it was the CIA that was behind that. And we know that for a matter of fact, Yes. it just, you know, whatever idealistic bubble you had, boom, it just, it just got, got blown away. I mean, it's just, we, you know, our government really isn't really necessary to look out for us. There's certain interests involved. And then 
as you become, you know, I, my, my training really is very much, uh, you know, Marxist. I'm a Marxist sort of, you know, critical when my scholarship kind of leans in that direction because it's the only way critical tool to use, step back and look at everything around us. You know, anything else that's within the system that's working within it, it's going to be very difficult to step out and look out the problems that it has, right? It's always kind of work, okay, liberal kind of mindset. Oh, there's problems here. We have to reform it, but there's there's deeper issues that you have to look at to really understand what's going on. So I, I incorporate all that. I take all that into into my my life, my personal life, and and in my activist life, as best as I can be active active in trying to help change the world, which also was involved in my teaching. This is why I gaffly because <laughs> sometimes I, I, I you know, if you, yeah, if define you that. Define yeah. a, a gaffly. A gaffly is, you know, the, the first definition is these little little insects that kind of, I don't know if they bite animals and whatever, they're always constantly picking, you know, and, and, and the metaphor for a person, which is the second definition, is a person that constantly is getting at people's, you know, this is wrong, this is wrong, and, you, and you, we got to change it, and hopefully with, with an eye to changing things. And I see myself as that way, you know, so, so my teaching has been like that. I challenge students because I think a lot of times we... And, and I wouldn't say anything to them that I did not have to go to myself because I had all these illusions myself. And a lot of times they come, and I guess why I'm one of those, you know, <laughs> one of those leftist professors that the right would want to eliminate, you know, from. And, uh, you know, and, and basically what we're doing is telling these students, this is, look, this is, this happened. Okay, now why did it happen? Uh, and sometimes they don't even know it happened, right? And so when you un uncover that, and you put it to them to, 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 to look at it, they sometimes get upset. And if you talk about white privilege and you talk about white supremacy and they happen to be white, then they of course get very upset that you're telling them they have privilege. And then you have to explain them why they are, even though they come, to, you know, I've had students come, I'm from like, you know, I live in a trailer out here in the North country, you know, and as I said, that might be, that might be the case. Look, I, I, my parents worked in factories, okay? I sympathize with you, but when it comes to you, when it comes to me, or it comes to an African-American student, you have privilege still. And then they begin to say, okay, and then I give them examples, why? And they go, oh, okay, maybe I can't argue with that, they say, but then why? And it's So, you know, I'm a guy fly that way. I really do try to get people to the, and you know, sometimes you do, if you look at my, you know, my professor, you know, which I stopped looking at those, but you'll have students go there, you know, he sits on his soapbox and talks and stuff like that. And I, I say, thank you. Thank you. If, you, if that's what you think, uh, I'm doing something to you to make you think, and you think it's me, but maybe you have to just think a little bit more about what, what we were talking about. So yeah, I'm a gaffi. <laughs> truly, truly, I am. I, I accept it. I accept that. And I think it's yeah. great that you wear it with like a, it's like a badge of courage. Oh yeah, absolutely, I, yeah. I do. Yeah. Um, we, we talked briefly, uh, uh, I'm not you. Uh, I did experience college teaching for a semester mm -hmm. at Rutgers, and, and I told you uh, it was one of the great experiences of my life to be in front uh, and to teach uh, college kids. Uh, and I did it two years ago. It, it, and I can't, I could never put in words what it felt like walking mm -hmm. to class. So, do you have uh, a I mean, you've been doing this for so long. Uh, and, you know, you did Fulbright, I think, in Barcelona. Um, yes, I did. Uh, uh, so do you have any, like, special kind of teaching highlights that you wow. want to highlight? Well, well you know, I... I, I a was loaded question. Yeah, the, because in 40 years, there's a lot. But uh, I, I began teaching in the University of Puerto Rico, you know, and, and, um, in 1981, when I was just 20 six you know <laughs> and I was very young and uh, I was sometimes only four years five years older than some of the students I had because I you know I taught seniors you know and so uh, it was it was a, it was a good experience just learning how to to handle yourself in the classroom that itself is great just the first time you know you mentioned the first time and I remember off, off air but it was just so wonderful and then you realize oh my it's great it's it's sort of your you have butterflies in your stomach and you're nervous and that never goes away quite frankly even after 40 years which is a good thing because you're meeting a new class this is another thing i love every year 
even as I got older, the students were almost the same age. And that was always a fantastic thing because I get, and I'm always, what are you all thinking about? What is, what is, what is the world like for you, you know, as an as a 18, 19, 20, 21 year old? And so that's always wonderful, those experiences. Um, countless times that in the class, we will be talking and I would say something and you see that, uh, you know, like they, they start thinking and then the light bulb goes on and I'm thinking, this is a, that's a great feeling. So somewhere taking them from, from you know, what, and it's not necessarily always political. Sometimes it's just the text that we're reading. Look at this passage. Why is this? And they, and they go, oh, yeah, I didn't see that. You know, so that is something that um, is, is important. But it's also, you, you have to try to also get them to see, obje you know, objective. I'm not, like, like I said, I am a leftist. And I, I tell my students right at the beginning, I'm leftist. This is, why? Because... You do a disservice and you go in there acting like you're objective. Nobody's objective. You know what I mean? It, it, we have professors in the same college that are, that are ultra right wing. They never say I'm an ultra, you know, right wing person who probably, you know, adores Trump. They, no, they don't say that I, because if somehow they feel like that. that but you're, what you're probably saying and how you look at things is probably going to be influenced by that. So I, off the bat, I tell them. And I think, you know, challenging them but at the same time says yeah this is what this ideological perspective says mm -hmm. right uh, as opposed to that so you have to kind of balance that out but it's always giving them a, a sense of of different alternatives and i offer definitely one and seeing lights go on thinking about uh things that they ne never perhaps even thought about barcelona was also interesting because i i went to barcelona it's a 2011 and this is a uh, different you know, Europe, right? And just even the, the professors, uh, one of the discussions as they took me out to a lunch, you know, to kind of welcome me and we started talking. This was almost, um, I think, after, um, I don't know, was it me? Osama bin Laden had, had been, I think he was, Joke. right? Yeah, he had been captured or whatever. It's close. Yeah. And so we, and then we also went, to, so that, that whole thing, right? And, and said, that, oh, I can't believe they, they just killed him like that. And I was like, you know, I understand what you're saying, but as an American who also had friends <laughs> and, and who barely got out, you know, uh, and, and everything that that caused, I have no pity for him. I'm sorry. You know, I mean, you know, and, you know, you, you, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. I'm not going to, oh, that would have been nice and great if they had taken him, you know, custody and they had given him a trial. You know, that, would have, that was going to be a show. That was going to be, and the security for that alone would have been. And of course, he resisted, so that's why he's died. But it's interesting, the Europeans would, would come down on Americans. And, and then the other thing was about guns. And here I am trying to explain to them gun policy in the U.S. and, and the the and how the fetish of guns in America, right? I am not, obviously, as a, as a, as a progressive, not, I don't love guns necessarily. And I, I think this is a gun culture that's gone crazy. I'm sorry. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I don't know if I really am against the Second Amendment completely, but certainly we could do better at regulating stuff, you know, than, than, than this. And just anybody can buy a gun. I mean, up here in enough country, you can go and buy it any. I mean, it's, it's insane, you know? And this is personal too, because as a person who, who for many years taught it up here for 20 years, and there's a lot of guns in this, in this part of, the, of New York. And, you know, you would always hear colleges being shut up. And I'm like, I'm, you know, in my high, the high school that my, 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 ton, my two sons went, is this, you know, at any moment, could they, you know, if you're not worried about stuff like that, then there's something wrong with you. I'm sorry. And we could definitely do better. So here we are, uh, you know, there's there's so many changes that we need and and people don't talk about them enough so i think the classroom certainly has always been for me right i mean I, I, I explaining that to, to to europeans over there who basically you people are what is with the guns and i try to work both ways speaking about your tests and you understand this is a big country <laughs> this is a big country and when it started out it was pitch black out there there was just wilderness and and animals and things you know i i can't you know, if you're from England, so some of them were English, it says, you know, you, you could put England into the United States, like, I don't know how many times, but, you know, quite a hundred times, probably. I mean, this is what we did, England, right? it's, it's, it's expansion, you needed a gun. I mean, I can see how you needed rifles, and you need to for survival. So we come from that, but then there's other aspects of this issue, 
that have to do more with racism, et cetera. It's more, it's a complex issue that is hard to get around. But at any point you're in that classroom, you're trying to deal with these very complex issues. You just hope that you're doing justice to what the learning process and to try to, um, you know, get the students to understand through literature, by the way, because this is all literature, right? We're talking about books that really kind of bring up these issues in literature in one way or the other. Uh, you to a great extent, me to uh, one semester, but uh, uh, as a, a journalist now, I, I've interacted with uh, a number of Gen Z and mm -hmm. I'm beginning to have a takeaway uh, that Gen Z and I, uh, where I would love your uh, opinion of Gen yeah. Z, my takeaway is they're, um, they're kind of uh, like super people uh, in that, uh, in certain areas. Uh, I, I knew when I grew up, we, we had six black and white TV stations that went off the air uh, at midnight. And I had the World Book Encyclopedia. That was my world, which right. is, is, is one minute little chip in, in uh, total obscurity. Point being, they mm -hmm. they have 24-7 input. So in yeah. certain areas, so I'm asking you your impression of Gen Z, because you've now... Yeah, well, I, I finished my career teaching you know, uh, and also have a son that I think is sort of in the cusp of the maybe millennial, you know, he's 23, going to 24. So he's in sort of in between, but he's also, I, I see him more really as I, Jen, or, or Z, you know, Jen. And um, first of all, I, I, I think you're right. All this multimedia is definitely affecting learning. Uh, it's more increasingly, I saw as the years went by in, in this late period of my teaching, that it was affecting sometimes how they wrote. I mean, I think sometimes they would use you are you know, <laughs> for your and things like that. And I then had to explain to them, you know, uh, that's valid, you know, in texting because it's another language in a way, you know, it's a script language that you use for efficient, uh, efficiency, but you can't do that in a normal sort of, I don't say normal, but certain standard traditional paper because this is formal language. So I try to explain it to them that way, not to say, you know, what, you can't spell, you know, that kind of thing. I just got to give it to them that there's room for everything, but you have to learn for here, this is the register that you use, right? So that was a problem. And then I find that they're increasingly quiet. They're not socializing as much. And this now, a lot of data is coming out that's showing that this is, you know, what I was observing in my class and other colleagues in the class. I, we see that this is now a, 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 a pandemic, actually, that they really are, are not... Um, able to socialize as much. So to try to get class discussion was increasingly harder. Yeah, to get them to do so a presentation, uh, so many of them have anxiety issues. So many of them, and I think maybe in one, one time I maybe mentioned this or maybe another podcast, but uh, when we took that, uh, I also took a, a group to Paris to uh, uh, as part of a, you know, Paris is a very literary city. So we had a, a class where we took them to, to Paris and for that trip, one of the things we had to do was all the students had to put their medication, what they were, you know, for, for purposes of health reasons and stuff like that. And I tell you, I think, I think we're taking 12 students and like the majority of them, like almost 10 of them had either depression, they were taking medication for depression, for uh, anxiety, anxiety or depression sometimes, or so, uh, and um, ADHD or ADD. I mean, Wow. 10 or 12 of them. Wow. And that was, I mean, it's a small sample, but I, 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 given what I see in my classes during that few last semesters, uh, they talk, you know, freely of, of, of their, of their mental issues and stuff like that. So it, it's something happening there for sure. And that I told, I would tell my young colleagues, I would tell, you know, I, 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 I feel for you. Cause I don't know. I don't know what that means for you in the future, having to teach the students who might become even increasingly, you know, worse when it comes to the mill. In fact, somebody mentioned just a, a study that came out that in the quote that uh, Anchor was saying, was, was citing was that, um, and this is a college, a psychiatrist, whatever, said that this generation, the G-Z, you know, I-Gen or C-Gen 
it might be the generation that has the most serious problems with mental illness. Wow. And um, part of it is this, this constant being texting and also the comparison, you know, comparing TikTok, you know, or, or, or Facebook, Instagram, which you know, everything's visual. And, and it's this idea that, oh, look at this person being so happy. You know, uh, the person that was referring to all this, uh, I think his name is Smirk, Smirk, Smirkanish. I think is if I pronounce it right, Smirkanish, right? He's, you know, has some wonderful commentary sometimes. Yeah, and he was focusing on this recent event with this young woman, Gabby Petito, I believe her name is, and how she she made her life so wonderful on Instagram, and obviously below the surface she was having serious issues with this young man, and at the same time, both of them had mental issues or mental problems that they were dealing with. So everything's not wonderful. And, and if you live with this sheltered life, isolated life, and when the pandemic, uh, one of the problems that I also see, it, 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 we got to give them a little bit of slack here because these young people are dealing with a, a pandemic. They're dealing with the crisis of climate change that they are, it's gonna, the brunt is going to be on them, right? They're dealing with an economy that is just absolutely not, you know, giving them the opportunities after they spend forty, fifty thousand dollars in college. Right. So then, then they have the stress of finding a job, and usually sometimes they're not finding as much work as they could in their area, right? And then they're also dealing with all kinds of, you know, nine eleven, the, the vestiges of nine eleven and, and terror and all this other stuff. I mean, that's hard growing up hard. in a time period like that. And so I have to, I have to give it to them. You know, I, again, I have two sons that, that are millennial and one is sort of, so I understand, I, 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 uh, I, I feel for them. And at the same time, I know there's a serious issues there. I am not one of those boomers who says, oh, these young kids, I hate, by the way, I hate that. When I see somebody writing in Facebook, you know, these young people are making, putting on memes that makes fun of them and because they're, they're destroying the wine industry because they don't drink wine <laughs> or, or, you know, they keep eating, you know, avocado toast and, they, they, you know, and all these other things that they make fun of. It's like, well, you know, look at the world that we created for them and maybe you should, you should um, look at that. So there is problems in learning for sure to really go back to your main point. There are absolutely problems because of the mental issues. You can't learn. I don't know how many students would just drop classes because they couldn't deal with the stress. And that, that's a serious issue that also so, goes on the classroom. It's so interesting because that was my brief observation. And when the pandemic started, about a month into it, I, I began to formulate the idea that as I interacted with students who I met on LinkedIn and, and we would chat and, and I, I've been a mentor uh, before the pandemic to 14 students. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, it was a full time job. I was forever running back to campus, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To the diner on campus, sitting down with students for an hour or two, lunch, and and talking about stuff and learning from them. Uh, and and uh, it it, it uh, I, I marveled at them, at, right. at their their level of, of the stuff up here. But right. I also said, uh, unlike any other generation in world history this this generation these gen z's are going to need more support i'm not talking about financial just no, support no. across the board no, I, I agree but you know maybe maybe you know hopefully they as parents will limit the amount of social media i hope they see it in themselves and that's because that's the cause that's that's yeah. one of the big causes i mean of course that, that, it is and i, I think there's no, that i see that absolutely different but one thing about gen gen z too that that i that i i, I always point uh, and also millennials at a certain point the these young people are really very compassionate i see most of them really be compassionate they firmly believe in you know and in, in sexual equality they they believe in and uh you know civil rights they believe in in, in, in you know doing environmentally you know uh, things that are, that are good for the environment so they really have the problem with me as i see that that's all good but they're so isolated they don't seem to really be as active as, as they should be given they understand the issues and problems Completely. they try to you know, they try to live a life of that but it's not enough to be an individual who does the right thing no, they are socially connected 
Yeah, oh, uh, and the they're very it. much to themselves. Right. They're, um, they're, they're, I observe a lot of loners in, yeah. that, in that world. Right. Um, just taking a, a, a deep breath. Uh, this has been heavy. Um, it is what it is. Uh, yeah. Heavy yeah, is yeah. good. Um, I, I always ask this, this question. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of my favorite questions. Uh, it requires a, a one-word answer, generally speaking, from you. Um, you know, that's going to be hard for for a writer and, and a professor of literature. And well, actually, this probably would be hard, and, and I'm going to uh, give you uh, extreme flexibility okay. in, in answering it. Meaning, uh, so here, here's the the question: uh, excluding family or friends, somebody living or dead you'd like to spend a day with, and it could be a couple, if you so choose. Mm. So you want an author, a writer? No, it could be anybody. Uh, I mean, it could be Roberto Clemente. Yeah, that would, that would help my work. <laughs> I, I read that somewhere uh, briefly yeah. uh, here. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I There's so many people that I admire. I would say, just because this comes to my mind too, I, I would love to, to have a chat with Toni Morrison, who just passed away, because as a writer, because I think she is someone that I admire greatly. I've read pretty much everything she's read, um, and how she managed to write so beautifully, so well, and pay attention to her craft at the same time that she wrote powerfully, really political books. I mean, she she wrote books that made you think. So that that would be because I could learn so much from her, and also just her life is amazing, in a way. So yeah, That's a perfect answer, mm -hmm. perfect answer, and and it's a good segue to jump into some of your your writings, your work. Uh, we've got migrations. You you have the accidental um, the accidental native. native. Could you just give a kind of a quick overview of, of your writings? Yeah, I have I have four books and one one academic. Uh, anthology, which is which is the only anthology that that deals with the literature of the Puerto Rican diaspora, you know, the you know the literature written by people like me, and so that that's academic. But but the four creative books are are, are the, the Family Terrace and other stories, which is a, my first collection of short stories. Uh, I have this Migrations, which just came out three months ago, and and war, I won the the award, uh, the Tomas Rivera Prize book prize. And I have also The Accidental Native, which is my one novel. And that novel really is about a return. It's a New York and who returns to Puerto Rico. It is the only novel, fictional, you know, narrative that has to do with the return of a Puerto Rican, you know, from New York wow. back to the island. Wow. Yeah. So that that's why I, I think it's an important book. I, frankly, I don't, I don't know what most, I mean, you know, these books is interesting because, and I don't say this because they're my books, but I, I also teach. And every time I used to teach Latinx literature, I always try to, write, you know, find a Cuban American kind of book and Mexican American, actually Mexican Americans will make really a big chunk of the course and, and, and a Dominican, you know, and, and I was a Puerto Rican. If I were not the writer of these books, I would teach this, these books because, especially like Central Native, because it really would, would shows you what it's like to have been assimilated somewhat and having to go back to Puerto Rico. And it gives a lot about the, the, the culture, more or less the 21st century culture uh, in, in, in the island. So um, yeah, that's, that's that. And then uh, I also have a, a collection of poetry. And this is odd, Kevin, because I, my first love was poetry. I, I loved poetry when I was in, in college. I was writing poetry and I wanted to write poetry. I want to be a poet. And, uh, and then I started writing a little fiction. And then when I went, applied to, to my MFA at Columbia, I decided to go fiction. I didn't do poetry, but I've always loved it. And I did this collection because there was a period that I wasn't writing any fiction because I was doing a doctorate, but I had, to, I've always had to write something creative. So I began to write poems because I, I you know, I, I had the time, it's, I could squeeze maybe a poem. Uh, I couldn't write long, longer pieces when I'm, I'm reading critical works and, you know, doing all kinds of other stuff for my, my doctorate. And so I, I combine all these poems and I put them into a collection that's called Boricua Passport, 
and that that is also uh, one of my books. So those up to date in in my next book, I hope to finish it next year. Is you know you mentioned Roberto Clemente in the book, and it's that story is really the beginning of this novella that I hope to finish next year. Okay, great. Um, back to Puerto Rico, which, as I, I said, was kind of a second home for me for a long time. While I was in sales, I would spend a month uh, of every year there uh, and explored the island and, and took my, my wife and son. So my son, we talk about this, my son grew up from, from being a, literally a baby uh, until he was, I mean, and in, in Puerto Rico was just part of, uh, and that's, I think, contributed to his writing and, and editing of Puerto Rico Strong, which was the number one graphic novel. But, but uh, I, 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 I don't know, admittedly, I don't know the, the intricacies of the politics and, and, and the whole notion of statehood and, and, mm -hmm. and you know, your, your overall view of Puerto Rico and, and mm -hmm. the economy and the statehood and all okay. the, the future, et cetera, et cetera. Wow, I wish I- That's I a loaded know. question. I know, I know. No, it's just, I wish I knew I could, I could foretell the future because I, I, I really think that I am going to probably die before Puerto Rico's, you know, becomes a, either an independent nation or, or a statehood. I, you know, it's just been dragging on. I think in short, the problem is a colonial problem. I think Americans have to really wake up and understand that the United States is an imperial power. It has been for a while. They have territories that for the modern period, they don't want to call colonies, but that's what they are. They're colonies. And Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States, right? Or if you want to be more accurate, it's a neo-colony because it is a different form of colony. They, you know, Americans are very adept at <laughs> shaping things and making things new. And so this is not really a colony like Britain, maybe had colonies, you know, with us, but it, it is, you know, they give us a little bit more of, uh, uh, you know, freedoms, uh, they give us a little bit more of government, we can elect our governor, but, you know, we don't elect, or we don't vote for president of the United States, and the president can send our people off to war, like they have done ever since the Spanish-American War. Uh, we cannot determine our uh, economy really because we, uh, you know, import so much from the U.S. We're just a market that they can dump stuff on, on us. We can't go to Japan like one of the governors in Andes Colón did back in the 80s and try to set up a treaty, <laughs> an economic treaty with Japan. And the United States, Schultz was the Secretary of State at the time, says, what are you doing? You can't do that. So stop this, you know what I mean? And, and I'm like, you know, I remember vividly that because I was living in Puerto Rico at the time and I, I kind of laugh. I says, what, what were you thinking? And on this Colón that you can go, you are a colonial subject of the United States. And that, it, if you don't think it is, you know, because he belongs to the Commonwealth party, which is this party that thinks that the US, Puerto Rico can have a little more autonomy. And I said, they're not gonna give you an autonomy that they don't want to give you, okay? That's the reality you need to understand. And so Americans have to maybe get aware of this issue. Do you really want your country to continue to have these colonies, in particular Puerto Rico, three, almost 8 million people, if you consider the people in the mainland, we call the mainland, I mean, the United States proper, right? Uh, we have Puerto Ricans living in all 50 states of the union. There's more people living in the United States now than in Puerto Rico. But you have 3 million people living in the islands, it really should be islands because it's not just one island, it's, you know, Culebra and Vieques and mm -hmm. Puerto Rico really is technically an archipelago, right? And, um, you know, we, we are still a colony. That's the bottom line. And how do you decolonize Puerto Rico? The UN says that it is a colony, has said several times that the US should do something, but the US needs to do something, not us. You invaded us, you took us over, you run the show really, inside out, if something happens economically, like recently happened, you set up a junta, that's what it's called, a junta, to basically 
like really suck the life of the whatever economy we had so that you can sort of uh, partly make money off it. And then secondly, basically control the, the, the spending. I just recently found out that, you know, uh, the University of Puerto Rico is getting cut because you know, I have friends still that teach there and that the University of Puerto Rico's main campus, the library got zero money, zero, not even a penny. So they're doing this across the board. They, and at one point, they were actually telling people that the, the um, I don't know if that went, they enacted that, but the minimum wage, they want to reduce it like $5. I mean, it, was, it is criminal what they're doing. And so this junta is in charge of the economy right now and every choice in this corruption, it's just a mess. It's just actually a hot mess. And I think if we here in the US and certainly we're all citizens, and I don't wanna refer to, to Americans who don't know, Puerto Ricans are American citizens. So American citizens are being treated this way. We're basically second class, maybe third class citizens, okay? I mean, if you be honest, right? Let's be honest about this. I'm being a guy fly here, I know. People don't want to hear this sometimes, but this is the reality. So to me, in, you know, I am pro-independence. Anyone knows me knows that. I would love Puerto Rico to be an independent nation because I think from the start we were trying to be. One thing that, you know, we were this close to becoming a sovereign nation. In 1897, you know, uh, Puerto Rican leaders were you know, involved with discussions and negotiations with, with Spain to let it happen, make it happen. And they... In 1898, like five, six months later, the U.S. invades over supposedly trying to help Cuba in the Spanish-American War, but then they invade Puerto Rico. You know, this, is, you know, this you got to think about this stuff, right? Because you mentioned this to people because this is sense that we're so awesome, the U.S. We're just awesome. We're no different than many other other nations, you know, when it comes to power and, and using military power in particular. And, and you know, we've been amassed an incredible, you know you know, military, the, the biggest and the most powerful in the world. And there's some people that think that you have that, you should really be, put, put, you know, pushing, you know, pushing people and you should be getting things done that way. And there's still people like that here. So do you realize that, and let me know is that, that even before that war began, under the premise that we have to help these poor Cubans liberate them from Spain, the horrible Spain empire. And then Roosevelt, who was at that time, the Secretary of Navy under McKinley, Sends, tells McKinley we should send a fleet down to, you know, down to South America, the Cup of Good Horn, I believe it is. Oh no, that's Africa. I don't know. You know, down the Magellan Strait, right? Down below and all the way to the Philippines so that when the war breaks out, we have a you know, force that can go in and, and invade the Philippines. A lot of people don't realize that part of the Spanish-American War was also in the Philippines. Yeah. And so why would you, if you're concerned about Cuba sent a fleet. This wasn't the Pacific fleet out there because I don't even know if we had a Pacific fleet by that time, probably not because I don't know if we were involved in Hawaii yet. I don't know, remember that, maybe so. But nonetheless, this fleet went around all the way to the Philippines to help the expeditionary force attack the Philippines and take it over, which they did until they found out that the resistance there was, that was like another Vietnam. By the way. Yeah. It was, it was a really uh, ugly yeah. kind of war that, that, that before Vietnam, these soldiers. It's um, funny. I was going to. The leader. Yeah. It was awful. I was going to ask you. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, the Philippines got their complete independence. Uh, and, and, and could Puerto Rico be a model uh, of getting their independence like we gave it to the Philippines? Well, th this is what this is what I, I, I would say to that. Getting back also to the original question, what what I, what I think the, the issue is decolonizing Puerto Rico. Now, some of my independentista friends might not like to hear this, but another way you decolonize Puerto Rico is statehood, believe it or not, because the idea is to end this yes. system we have now. This is not the right thing because at least with a state, Puerto Rico would have representation would have maybe five, about five congressmen, you know, six of it, and maybe two senators, you know, given the dysfunctionality of that, I don't know if that would help a little bit, but you've got to be better, right? Having somebody representing you than having one person that has voice, you know, that's, which is, doesn't mean anything. So that's a way of doing it. I think what we need is a referendum. We've had referendums over and over, and I'm sick and tired of this referendum because they don't mean anything. Why? They're not binding. 
they're just like a thermometer, you know, like what, 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 what's the, what's the, what's the feeling now? Okay. Statehood. Okay. Well, you know, oh, keep it the way it is. You got to have these two options and those two options only, not a third option that is a, a sort of an enhanced colony, which is what it is, right? We need statehood or we need independence. Either way, the U.S. has to do its job, what's the right thing, and take the lead in this and say to Congress, all right, let's have this referendum. Let's consider these two options. That's the only two options on the table because, you know, this is only way to solve the problem. And we either accept Puerto Rico as a state or we give it its independence. And by doing that, we also have to have a plan, economic plan to help them because it's like reparations. Mm -hmm. You need to, you know, you've given to every country you fought with, you've given them something and then you're not going to give us war. Right. And then the issue of those who do citizenship is on the table. Does that mean that Puerto Ricans still can keep the dual citizenship if they want or they don't want, uh, or after a certain period, they can't have it, whatever but you need that, all these things, but you need to work on that. And no, they're not, this, this Congress who increasingly is more dysfunctional, they can't even pass an infrastructure, infrastructure bipartisan bill. <laughs> Both of them agreed and they still can't pass it, man. So I don't know. I mean, can they do something like that? That's, I think to me would be the way to go. That's what I would like to see, but I don't know if it's gonna happen. Oof. <laughs> it's a lot to unpackage, I know. Yeah, it's a package. Um, so, uh, winding down, mm -hmm. because this has been, this has been wonderful, uh, mm. this time with you. Winding down, I'm going to use um, one of my favorite words, the big R, I call it, retirement. Mm. Um, uh, how do you look forward to that besides the writing projects that you want to do? Well, you know, writing obviously is the main thing I want to do, but now I figure I can be more of a gadfly. I can, I can, really, I can now spend more time putting, the, you know, these issues that really concern me, including, you know, the one that you're very, very concerned with is, which is climate change. I, I just, I just cannot see how we can continue to leave our, you know, children and grandchildren this mess and not try for, the, for how many years I have on earth to try to help somehow in my, in my little way to move it forward, right. you know? I, that, so that's a very important thing. I want to I want to get more active in things. I have friends that are very, very passionately activists and they've used every time in that way. So I definitely want to do that. And, and also, uh, you know, I, I want to travel. I do want to see some more of the world and my wife and I are, 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 we love to travel. And of course it's a little harder now with the, with the pandemic, but we're going to see how that goes. So we definitely will be traveling and writing and hopefully getting involved in, 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 in these issues. That seems to be enough to take enough I, of my time, uh, right? Uh, that's exactly what I've done. Uh, uh, we've traveled quite a bit before the pandemic. I've mm -hmm. done some writing. I do this. Uh, um, and and you get involved in, in causes and stuff. So um, I have to... Uh, I have to give you uh, uh, not words of advice. I don't have to do that, but mm -hmm. I can tell you that uh, uh, retirement is wonderful. Well, so far I like it. You know, I, this is a story I, I went just recently because one of the last things I, I don't know. I don't know. I keep joking that retirement is work, though. At, early on, it's work. <laughs> There's a lot of things you have to do to get to be retired. And so one of the things I had to do, I had to go in and turn in my keys and. And get a new ID card for you know for if I want to go to the library and all this other stuff and just wrap things up and so I'm walking on campus you know and I'm passing you know uh, classrooms as I see the professor teaching through the window and I'm like you know I'm, I I did that moment I got a little pang I'm like oh I really love that but I can always do that I have a friend that is in charge of the honors program and she's already extended an invitation you know Jose whenever you want to teach your classes let me know. And so I'll take you up on that because I, you know, I still love the classroom and I love the engagement with young people. That's another thing I could do, you know, little by little teach. I think I will always be a teacher, Calvin. I, I will always feel like I, I if, if, you know, if, if, this, if people are willing to learn things, I, I, I will, I, and I can help them in that. I, whether it's writing, which I also enjoy teaching and helping young writers get better at their, at their craft. So I think I'll be busy. I think I'll be- Yes, you will be busy. Um, there's, there's nothing like it. it, it it's, it's, like, it's like Disneyland. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, 
A lot of, a lot of places it's to go. Really a Disneyland of just a, you know, adventure land. You want to pick up and travel. It really is. I'm making this up as I go along. But yeah. the more I think about my retirement, it is Disneyland. And and uh, good or bad, it's work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's work. I, I don't yeah. think I've ever been as engaged in anything as I've been doing what I'm doing now. Uh, you know, it's 12 hours of engagement to put this all together. Yeah. Uh, and it's the best. And by I, the I, way, I believe, uh, I believe that the more that you engage and the more that you challenge, and uh, uh, I, I think medically, it keeps True. this thing up here really True. functioning Absolutely. quite well yeah i've read i've read about i read about that because i think one of the concerns we all have as we get older is is our memory in our, you know you know you know and keeping our, our brains uh functioning you know at the highest level that yeah. we can and i've read a lot about that and i i said well i'm not gonna have it because i, I if i'm not gonna be a writer i'm writing i'm writing i'm doing things my mind will always be but you also have to keep yourself um uh, you know mentally active in other ways yeah. I agree with you. And I, if any of your viewers, you know, are our age or are going to think re retirement, these are, I think, good, good advice. Great advice. Them. You keep yourself doing something, whether it's even trying to learn a new language or if at one time you were musical and you, and you want to pick up that instrument, you know, that, that, that you play back, do it again, because that, those are all things that help your, your brain. Well, uh, we've done chapter one. Uh, <laughs> reminds me of Neil Simon. We finished chapter one, uh, and, and uh, you and I will be corresponding with environmental things, et cetera. Uh, and I cannot thank you enough for your graciousness, your time, your energy, your, your words, and your spirit. This has been great, JL. And, and, and since we're, you're a movie guy, uh, I'm going to paraphrase Clint Eastwood uh, a little bit by saying to you now, you made my day. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I saw that one too. <laughs> yeah. um, and all those spaghetti westerns that he made. Yes. Yeah. We, yes. Maybe someday we should sit down and talk about film, man. Um, well, first of all, I mean, I just thank you so much. I mean, I, I've done several of these podcasts. Let me tell you, uh, and this, is, this is one of the most enjoyable ones. Well, for thank sure. you. I mean, and it has a lot to do with you. Your your life has been amazing, man. I mean, it's like you're, you're a role model for, for the rest of us to, to do, like, you know. By the way, I mean, I've, I've been repeating what you said to my two sons, by the way, about the 17, what is it, 17? 17, 17 uh, Gen Zs today will have 17 jobs and five careers before they hang it up. Right. And so they were like, Wow. Even my old, my eldest says, "Man, that's a lot." A lot. But he, he said, "I can see it." And you, you sort of like you're not Gen Z, but you you've had several careers, and I think that that's amazing. I've had five in the last ten years. Yeah, and you you you're functioning well. You love it. I think that's uh, uh, also another model for people not to be afraid to change things and do different things. Some some of, some of our folks, you know, like rumors sometimes are afraid to kind of like do new things and and um they should just go for it you know and 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 if you want to do it do it but it's, you know, the worst thing you could do is sit around man and watch tv all day mm. that is the worst thing you could do terrible mentally terrible. and physically you know correct correct uh so um please come back i'm saying this formally now please come back uh uh and i think you will mm -hmm. and uh I, again this is this has been so actually it's been therapeutic for me mm. to listen to you because uh, uh, actually uh, I would like to be like you I, I, I think I, I uh, if I have any kind of regrets it, it's not having taught longer mm. uh, and experienced that great joy of what you experienced I think you would have been a great teacher because you know what, what you're doing now is a form of teaching in many ways. I think I can see you in a classroom. I can definitely, but you know, again, you know, we all grew up, our generation, certainly people telling, this is what you should do, right? I mean, this is, a, and, and sort of you were supposed to stick to one job for the rest of your life. That was the plan for, for our, yeah. our generation. Right. And, um, you know, I, I've moved around. I, I have wanderlust. I, I just, you know, 
I've lived in several places. I, I keep going back and forth, and maybe that, you know, maybe that keeps me on my toes. I don't know, but it's been it's been for me so far a great life. I can't. The other day I was thinking about that. You know, as in retirement, says I can't complain. I have no regrets, and the regrets are so minor. You know, yeah, they're, they're, not, they're not life like, you know, it has an impact on my life. I would have done this maybe a little different, but so and so again, yeah. Thank you so much for. Yes, for thank allowing. you. Um, I'm gonna close. We're gonna officially close. Uh, this was great, truly. Thank you. I would love to be back. Hey, maybe when, when my novella comes out. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. You're, I'm, I'm here uh, 18 hours a day, seven days a week, so come back. Thank okay. you, JL. Thank you.